All right. We're going to start with the first session, talking about community science. I'm going to turn it over to my staff, Sheila Scalero, who's going to introduce our speakers this morning. Thank you, Ed. Um, good morning, everyone. As Ed said, my name is Sheila Scalaro. I am the community program scientist with the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. I'm thrilled to be kicking off the Basis 7 ANAP meeting with a community-based science session. Citizen science is research that engages the community members in playing an active role in the scientific method. So up first in this session, we have Liz Wist and Chandler Joyner with the Maryland Coastal Bays Program. Liz is their education coordinator and Chandler is their environmental educator. Together, they will be presenting Living Local, an agricultural education project for students and the community. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz, and this is my co-worker Chandler, and we're here to present on Living Local, an agricultural education project from the Maryland Coastal Bays Program. As we're the opening presentation for the conference, we wanted to keep everybody on their toes and start off with a little vegetable joke. So a hint's gonna be provided at the end of the presentation. And for the first person that might know the answer at the end, just come up to one of us and we have a farmer's market bag and a nature journal for you. So the joke is what is small, red, and whispers. And this is a play on words too for the vegetable joke. So don't look it up. All right, so now that we're all very invested, we wanted to start off this presentation with a useful visual to get everybody oriented to the location of our project. On the screen now is the NEP map that we know well, and that orange circle, I know it's a little bit harder to see, that's where the Maryland Coastal Base Program is located. Here's a closer look, and we're right there at that number 12, very tiny. Coastal Bays is a 175 square mile watershed located in the only seaside county in Maryland, Worcester County, with shared bays to our north and south with Delaware and Virginia. 71% of the land in our county is agricultural land, managed either as a private farm or working forest. I'm pointing this out now because it's an extremely essential element of our project. So Living Local began in 2020 as a small program to educate watershed residents on the positive practices farmers were utilizing. It's since grown into a watershed-wide agricultural initiative that provides coastal bays youth, educators, residents, and visitors with learning opportunities about how local sustainable farms are working to improve soil health and water quality. All right, so let's backtrack for a minute and look at the initial need of our project. Living local stemmed from multiple factors. We first considered the needs within our CCMP and looked at the items that were being identified as a priority action for 2020. One was that Coastal Bays would work with um, our partners to foster a greater appreciation of farming by informing the public of the positive changes that farmers were implementing to protect natural resources. Our second need came from the fact that the majority of people who grow up in our county grow old there, meaning that those that go through our local school system end up becoming our future decision makers. So there's a very important need for our community to understand sustainable regional farming practices. This leads us to our third need, and that is that there's no agricultural education curriculum currently integrated in our public school system, and no public place-based agricultural education in our, for our community members. Additionally, with agriculture being the second largest industry in our county, many residents also end up being employed in the field. So to sum it up, there's a disconnect between our farms and those working the farms, and the rest of our community and our school system. So after considering our needs, we then brainstormed what our broad project goal needed to be in order to address those items. So we concluded that we needed to develop, hmm, develop an education program that would build an understanding of the issues affecting agriculture and develop a lifelong appreciation of farming or work to develop a lifelong appreciation of farming and the best management practices farmers were implementing to protect our watershed. Ideally, some of our outcomes from this project would include increased access um, to free and online in-person education programs, improved environmental literacy and growth in the environmental stewardship of our watershed, and an increased awareness of or investment in 
local agriculture and food systems. So with our project goal in place, our next steps were threefold. We first wanted to engage our backbone partners uh, who specialized in realms such as agricultural education, land conservation, and farmer support. On the screen, you're gonna see our partners listed, and I know these are just logos, so not everybody knows since we're in Maryland. Um, but as we know, partners are uh, just important aspects of all project, and for us, they provided a voice in areas where we had less expertise. So just to highlight a few, we only have one school system. There's no different districts. It's just one school system for our county. Again, we're very small. So we partnered with them. They're extremely important for the project. Our local extension, and on the state level, the Maryland Agricultural Education Foundation. Um, as we know, funding is also needed for large-scale projects, and we are able to kickstart through an EPA environmental education grant that we received in the spring of 2020. And the final thing that we needed in order to establish Living Local was to build relationships and trust with farmers in our watershed. To help determine our group of farmers that we'd concentrate on, we looked towards the expertise of one of our amazing partners, a group called Future Harvest. You'll see them up on the screen now. And they work specifically with farmers who are actively working, already working towards um, the protection of their land and soil and strengthening the regional food system. Per their recommendation, we looked at small scale farmers for the initial start of this project. And with those two factors, it gave us a pool of approximately 15. So we've gone over the why this project was needed and the what was needed parts of Living Local. So our next steps were to develop activities that would make this project as accessible as possible for our community. So I'm gonna hand it off to Chandler now, who will discuss the mechanisms we use to address our project goals. Hello everyone. Um, so as Liz mentioned, we wanted to make Living Local accessible to a wide variety of people. And to do this, we implemented programs that targeted our general community, educators, and students. Living Local was available to the community through on-farm workshops. These two-hour educational events are free and open to the general public. Uh, they're held at local small-scale farms and involve a farmer-led tour and a hands-on component. These are a chance for the community to learn about local farmers and their practices and are also an opportunity for our partners to present on relevant community efforts that they conduct. Separate from these community workshops are the Living Local Educator Trainings. As Liz mentioned, there's never been a specific academic program in our watershed that provides agricultural education to students. And as such, a curriculum needed to be created. Um, the result consists of the five lessons you see on the screen, as well as a student field journal. These lessons not only focus on agriculture, but they also address specific watershed issues that are a result of poor management. Um, quick note about lesson five. Lesson five focuses on food system connections. Um, and accessibility to local food is an ongoing concern. And we in no way want to discourage students about the way that their family acquires food. And this is the note I want to make is that this um, is fully addressed in the educator training, which brings me to that we created an online learning module to teach the educators the curriculum. This two-part training was available um, in a self-guided portion and then a virtual session via Zoom, and educators were required to complete both sessions to receive access to the lessons and the supplemental materials. After attending the training, educators then go back to their audience and deliver the lessons. Any educator anywhere is welcome to complete the training and receive the curriculum, but this next portion is only applicable to educators in our watershed per the grant agreement. So upon giving the lesson, educators, whether formal or non-formal, are qualified to bring their groups out for a farm field trip to a partnering small-scale farm in our county. On the day of the field trip, students are led through a farm tour and then rotate through three hands-on learning stations, one of which is led by the farmer. And then the next step after these field trips, oh, and I do think we're having some issues with the clicker, but there are photos, cute photos of students on field trips. Um, and then the next step after these field trips is for, oh, perfect. So 
cute students on field trips. And then I think we have an, another one, hands-on, oh, learning stations, there we go, perfect. And so then the next screen, the next thing you'll see on the screen are a list of action project ideas and inspirations. Um, some of you may know that action pro project completion is a vital aspect of the environmental education continuum. And so these projects help students implement problem solving skills that they gain during the lessons and on the field trip. And action projects also help grow critical thinking skills. And so this is a list of some of the ideas sent around to educators. And it also includes uh, the bolded option on top, raise garden beds is funded by the EPA grant. So that's something we can provide to students. Um, I wanna take a moment here to make a quick note about our timeline. We applied for the EPA environmental education grant in January, 2020, and then we received funding in May with a project start date of October. Um, I don't know if you all recall what happened in March, 2020, but we sat there with all of these plans to bring students out to farms and have in-person educator trainings and community workshops. So with the new world of virtual learning, we adapted the educator training to be completely virtual and delayed our timeline for field trips and community workshops. Um, so while we technically had a start date of October, 2020, we couldn't technically even begin to think about bringing students out until a year later. Um, as of today, through our partnership with six local farms, we have completed three community workshops and one on-farm field trip. We have seven field trips planned for April and May, and our final community workshop will be held in the fall. I'm happy to report we've reached our targeted number of educators, and as our in-person possibilities have increased, we are excited to continue evaluating the success and impact of the project. Uh, project success is being measured primarily through formative surveys. Students complete pre and post field trip surveys, community members complete surveys following the workshops, and um, all farmers receive from surveys following all programs. And on the screen are some examples of survey questions asked. We will be integrating a summative survey process for our educators who have been involved in multiple steps of the project from curriculum development to action project completion. And we are also constantly reevaluating our next steps based off partner input um, from the amazing partners Liz mentioned earlier, we have monthly partner meetings. So our EPA grant funding comes to a close this October. And with that, we will be turning our attention to our long-term sustainability plan. So some components will continue to occur annually, such as the educator trainings, as it's been completely created, and the community workshops. And those future participants will continue to be surveyed. Other components will be absorbed by our partners. So our county public school system uh, has begun the process of integrating the created curriculum into a systemic, meaningful watershed educational experience, or a MIWI, if anyone is familiar. We are looking forward to a spring full of farm field trips and continued project development. Um, any, any educators or outreach specialists out there who are interested in the curriculum or the online learning module, uh, we can absolutely give you access to all of that. If you just contact us, reach out to us, or anybody seeking more details, please, please feel free to contact us. Um, I know you were all absolutely on the edge of your seat with our riveting joke, but um, do you want to have somebody guess now or do you want to? Sure. Um, the joke was, what is small, red, and whispers? Does any, we'll just take it out. Does anybody think they have it? And raise your hand and feel bold. Yes. A, a little a close, super close. I'm going to give it to you. Anyway, does anybody want to help them out potentially? Oh, yes, a horseradish. Yes. Oh, play on words. Yeah. So we have a prize for both of you. So that'll be perfect. Um, but thank you guys so much for your time and attention. We're going to wrap it up for the questions now. If anybody has any questions? So the curriculum was written for second through fourth grade per the grant because we were integrating that into the school system for the elementary level, but any non-formal educator, all the lessons can be adapted to students older or younger. So for formal educators, second through fourth are the ones that can come out on field trips, but for non-formal educators, any age can participate. Um, yes, well, I actually just worked with the curriculum with a 
Girl Scout troop leader and adapted many of the lessons to apply to her high school troops. Um, so that is in the works, but right now it's just written through second through fourth, but it is constantly like flowing and adapting depending on, I work like closely with what each educator is like seeking from the curriculum. If you do have, oh, sorry. <laughs> if you do have any questions, if you could come either see Joe, raise your hand and Joe will come to you um, with a microphone. I think they want to hear now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, that's online too. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just curious because one of the big things that I feel is kind of contentious between EPA and USDA is that EPA really doesn't have much jurisdiction on impacting USDA as far as like watershed protection and there's a lot of voluntary programs that USDA does. Are you seeing um in such young children are you are you getting feedback where they're asking well why why do they do this or why do we fertilize or or does it not really get into that as much as it's like this is where you're feeding we definitely get into practices that farmers implement. So each farm was selected based off of the sustainability practices that they use. Um, and so that is touched on primarily in like the learning stations at the field trips and each lesson does have a component of that. And so students are being engaged in topics like soil health and water quality and specifically what farmers can do to help protect those two things. Um, and I don't know if you have something you'd like to add to that. Yeah, that's a really good question. We have, um, Teachers actually gave us feedback because I think we even put more into the curriculum, maybe vocab wise and concept wise, being a little bit ambitious and we got feedback. So we actually pulled back from a little bit of those concepts, but we are seeing from the one class that we've brought out now that they've gone through multiple steps, not yet the action project is um, that they have students continuously asking questions back in the classroom and wanting to do more like on their school grounds and things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Um, up next, we have Evelyn Medina and Erica Moulton with the St. Petersburg College STEM Center. Evelyn is obtaining an environmental science degree and was an intern at SPC. Erica is the STEM director at the STEM Center at Bay Pines, and together they will be presenting Wake Gopher Tortoise in Habitat Restoration. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I wanted to start out with a quick map of where our project area is. So if you're from the area, uh, we are really close to Madeira Beach, uh, just across the causeway there, the bridge uh, down here, um, that enters the Madeira Beach area. So we're on the intercoastal. Um, the property is uh, highly developed, uh, uh, but we are the large green, I don't know, I need a, person to tell me what that shape is, but um, <laughs> we're that large green patch and the college owns all of that property. So it's a little easier to see in this next map. Um, here's the jurisdictional boundaries and the information about the property. Uh, the property is the newest property owned by St. Petersburg College. Uh, the building opened four years ago, so technically we were open about 14 months and then we were shut down for COVID. So in the interim, this project proceeded. Um, what's important to note is that um, here at the top of the, the map, that's where the building is see on this side too that's where the building is and then the rest is just open property so the entire campus is just shy of 50 52 55 acres and the college owns a submerged land which is this lagoon here so locally most people call that hurricane hole it's famous for uh, being a place to store your boats a lot of folks water skied there um, and the property originally um, in the 40s had some executive homes that were people who lived and worked at the VA hospital um, then the property was turned over to Pinellas County Schools and then in a land transfer, uh, the college took the property over and built a STEM center there. Um, so the interesting thing about this, though, is this, this hurricane hole throughout the 30s and 40s. Um, get this one over here. I can't do it over there. Sorry. Throughout the 30s and 40s, uh, this area was continually dredged. And so the focus of this project today and our information is about this little peninsula that sticks out because this little peninsula that sticks out was created because every time the lagoon there or hurricane hole was dredged, the spoil went onto that little peninsula. 
So we've had several estuary program mini grants. We have a current environmental restoration fund living shoreline grant. Um, and so normally when you talk about estuaries, most people may think of like sea turtles or terrapins, but we are actually thinking of gopher tortoises because of what's going on here in this little peninsula. Uh-oh. Work? Technical difficulties. <laughs> okay, so here's a close up of that landmass. It's a different in habitat than the rest of the property. Uh, it doesn't have mangroves except on the inside. Um, and it does have a lot of uh, salt barren, salt turn, um, open pine flatwood. We've also got a lot of cactus growing in there. Again, because it is the spoil, so it's really high in elevation compared to the rest of the property. Um, so we walked out there onto the property and noticed that at some point there had been gopher tortoise burrows. We contacted FWC, had them come out and scope at least two of the burrows, indicated that there probably had been gopher tortoises in this property at some time, but they were gone. They were taken by everybody from just people who are interested in having a pet turtle um, to homeless populations who've gone throughout the area. So um, they talked to us about this area being high enough in elevation to do potentially a reintroduction process of gopher tortoises in this specific type of habitat. Okay, so we started in. Oh, I can see. We started in August uh, with that permit. Um, instantly after the biologist came out, they issued the permit, um, and then we were advised to go ahead and install that silt fence based on our mapping information that we presented to them, the soil surveys we presented. Turns out it was going to be perfect habitat for reintroduction of wave gopher tortoises. And as all of us who know, uh, currently in Florida, we're running out of habitat to release uh, injured gopher tortoises or those that need to be relocated because of construction. Um, so right away, we worked on getting a silt fence installed. So the interesting thing was it took a little bit, back one, it took a little bit of time because of the fact that that silt fence had to be at the uh, top part of the property uh, where we still are a salt barren or salt turn and runs through an area where the mangroves. So it took a little bit of work uh, to get one installed, um, but we did. We had to have one installed before the first tortoise released. And so we did start to release tortoises uh, January of 2020. And then this became a, a student project or a citizen science project because of the fact that every place else that could take tortoises was closed, but we stayed open. So let me introduce you to Evan. Hello, my name is Evelyn. Um, so in January 2020, we did have the release of our first gopher tortoise. He was rightfully named Titan, which is the SPC mascot. Um, shortly after that, in March 2020, we had a release of four other tortoises, Spartacus, Shelley, Lucy, and Calamity Jane. Um, obviously, having the release of all five of those tortoises, it kind of just led into we needed some sort of personnel to kind of keep track of their activities and what they were doing on this little peninsula. So we had our first intern in May 2020 named Leonard Sala. During his internship, he did experience the release of two tortoises, one named Oceanus in June 2020 and the second in July 2020. After his internship ended in July, we followed with August 2020 with Alexandra Jacobson. During her internship, she was there for the release of Stanley in October 2020 and ended her internship shortly after that in December of 2020. We did have a little bit of a lull. I came next in May of 2021. I started the camera trapping. I was mainly just focusing on who was still present in the area after we had numerous hurricanes, along with what type of borough associates we were looking at that were inhabiting their boroughs. Um, I technically ended my internship in July of 2021, but I did continue to stay there. This is just a short clip of different borough associates that we saw during my time. <laughs>
And then in August of 2021, Dylan Faye came and started his internship there. I was still with the STEM Center and he kind of just took my footage, condensed it and organized it into different groups. Um, while he was there, we did have two more tortoises released in August of 2021, Elsa and Boris. He technically ended his internship in November of 2021 and shortly thereafter moved on to the University of Florida. And then after he left, just before we came here, we had our release of our final tortoise number 11. He does not have a name. And he was released in January of 2022. Now, where did all of this data lead us? So when we were watching it, we did notice that there were a lot of avian activity in our boroughs, which kind of led us to try to see if there were any documented official things about these avian behaviors. So we started looking more into the research. And I'll have Erica go over the different papers we found. Okay, so we started with um, the 1989 paper. Um, we talked to a lot of gopher tortoise folks who were in the Bay Area and around. Um, this particular paper seems to be the one where a lot of folks refer to um, in terms of uh, avian species or, or all the mammal species that are present, um, known borough associates, um, that we all get that number from 340 or 347 known borough associates. A lot of these animals hadn't been seen before at the STEM Center, um, but as we did more and more camera work, we noticed more and more animals, which is great, but we also noticed more and more birds. So we kept reading more papers, um, and then finally that led us to that last one, that birds and burrows. Um, in 2017, um, they've documented 34 specific avian species using gopher tortoise burrows. Uh, there's been a couple other papers since, um, but of course we had started on this paper back in the fall. So anyways, um, that uh, led us to start documenting the avian behavior that we were seeing in all of those videos um, and combining them and compressing them and see if we could recognize some behaviors and then talking to some ornithologists about the different types of behavior that we were seeing. So the first one is this noticeable increase in avian display behavior when they entered the burrows or were near the burrows. Oh, looks like it should be a video. Um, you could do both of that. Okay. So most of these behaviors are classified as either flashing, wing flashing, anting, dust bathing. Oh, mockingbird. Okay, and then the next category uh, was a lot of foraging. Thank you. 
It's one of the times we caught a tortoise and a vernum. So um, we have one more video real quick, um, teaching behavior. I'll just show it uh, a couple seconds of it. Um, oh, gee. Because we're in the two minute mark. Mm. Oh. Um, so this one doesn't have any music to it and so I can talk over, but the, um, there's a cardinal family that moved in above a burrow and the male and the female not only fed their offspring from the burrow and the sand apron skirt of the burrow, um, but then once their uh, offspring fledged, they brought them down into the sand and began teaching them how to search in the sand. So we have quite a few hours and hours of video where they were using uh, the skirt um, in order to teach their offspring how to look for food. So it's a really interesting thing to continually watch. Um, considering the citizen science project started out just monitoring where my tortoises and where did they go. Go ahead to the next. Um, so uh, we have started logging all of our tortoises and all the burrows. We started with two documented openings that FWC came and camera scoped, and now we actually have. Can you click on the link? Mm -hmm. Gary, Gary, can you Gary's working on. So we've had the students create a, a Google Earth map. So now uh, we can continually access the map. And if it does pull up, um, each of the burrows is now marked. Um, many of the tortoises have created multiple burrows, um, have shared burrows, and we've watched some mating behavior between the tortoises. Um, but now each burrow in the map, uh, you can zoom in on the burrow and then the information about that tortoise and its known associates, um, the images have been uploaded there. So. Um, Pretty neat project. Um, normally, it's kind of like the graduate school level where you would have sat for 100,000 hours and watched uh, tons and tons of videos, <laughs> but um, both Dylan and uh, Evelyn here have completed the program at um, SPC. Did it show? No? Pretty cool map. Yeah, too. the link to the presentation. Right up here. At the end of the presentation. There's another one. That's okay, sorry. Trust me, yeah. the cool Google map. <laughs> if you can get to the next slide, that's fine. Right. Um, so we just owe a special thank you to a lot of folks who know George Heinrich, uh, Jim McGinnity, um, and then all the folks at FWC who helped us um, with this project. Um, so we officially do have uh, the last bird that we saw was we've uh, had burrowing owls move into the property, which is what you want to happen when you have gopher tortoise burrows. So. Um, so do you have any questions? Oh, we're out of time. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Oh, um, so here. please so come, yes, make sure to come see Erica and Evelyn. Um. So our first virtual presentation will be from Andre Skripnikov. Andre is an assistant professor of statistics at New College of Florida. He will be providing a presentation on using using localized Twitter activity for red tide impact assessment. All right, so hello everybody. Can can everybody hear me? I guess, could I get any confirmation on yes. that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, all right, perfect. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Yeah, so um, yeah, couldn't make it here today in hold person. Hold on one, Andre? Oh, Andre, yeah. hold on one moment. We're pull, we cannot see your screen. Have you received okay. a? Yeah, I'm share. I mean, it says I'm sharing it. Um, okay, let me do well, it just again. Just hold on. Oh, okay. It's not you. It's us. Sorry. Just hold on one moment, okay. please. I'll let you know when we see it. Sure. Those of us who are here virtually can see the screen just fine, just to let you know, Andre. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so, okay, uh, so, yeah, apologies for all the inconveniences, yeah, so I'm tuning in from Sarasota, hopefully my voice carries uh, from there, uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to be presenting on the uh, project uh, titled uh, Using Localized Twitter Activity to um, Assess Red Tide Impacts, and that pertains to the Florida Red Tide event of uh, 2018 specifically, and that was done with the uh, great people of Tampa Bay Estuary Program, um, and uh, also with uh, Nate Wagner, who is a student at uh, our graduate data science program at New College of Florida, where I work as a professor of statistics. So uh, yeah, next slide, please. Right. So uh, first of all, just I, I feel like most of you know it, but anyway, to make sure we're all on the same page, the red tide is a uh, classic kind of uh, way to refer to uh, algal bloom of the dinoflagellate uh, Carinia brevis. It is toxic to fish, wildlife, and humans. Uh, and the event of 2018, yeah, if you could show the next slide, please. The event of the 2018 was, while not the uh, longest uh, in history, but uh, severity and extent of it and the damage it's done to the uh, Florida's Gulf Coast communities definitely brought some media attention to it. You can see some of it, um, some of the impacts represented on the picture here of the dead fish as one of the tangible impacts for sure. Um, and one, I guess, silver lining to this event was that it was the first one during the era of social media. If you could show the next slide, please. Yeah, so um, it's, uh, yeah, so, and people would be flocking to uh, platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram to both receive information and also potentially share their own experiences, maybe do some on the ground reporting and things of that nature. Uh, and in the next slide, you will be able to see how we were using uh, those Twitter dynamics to kind of retrospectively evaluate the um, event, right? So the impacts of the red tide back in 2018 uh, and see if we can kind of use those to, as a reflection of um, like the Twitter dynamics, use them as a reflection of the actual red tide impacts. And we've specifically focused on the Tampa Bay surrounding area on the five counties going all the way uh, from up in Pasco down to Sarasota. Um, yeah, and uh, in order to obtain tweets that were relevant to those specific locations, if you could go to the next slide, we uh, were um, using tweets that were either explicitly geotags where a person just literally says, okay, this tweet is coming from a specific area and you can see it on the right hand side picture here, how you can mark yourself in that regard. And then on the left hand side picture, you see how it marks that the tweet is coming from that specific area. But the issue with that approach is that the amount of tweets that were explicitly geotagged is pretty scarce. Only 1.5% of all tweets are explicit, explicitly geotagged. Uh, and that led us to the next slide where we considered uh, using the uh, user's geo profile information to at least for us to make an inference of where the tweet might have come from. Right, so we look at the user's profile information on the right hand side here. If it says that it's from a relevant county, then we would consider the tweet to have potentially come from that county, even though the tweet itself, as you can see on the left, doesn't say where it came from explicitly. And that augmented our data set up to about 17,000 of total relevant tweets. And by relevant, we mean with a mention of red tide explicitly. Uh, and that would include original posts, replies, and uh, retweets. So next slide, please. Um, yeah, so that slide, let's let's skip that one. Yeah, that's, that's a fun one, but we, yeah, I, I want to skip that one, yeah. So the uh, uh, local red tide conditions, uh, so just to set the stage of what kind of um, dynamics to expect from Twitter, we, I wanted to set the stage with the actual hierarchy of red tide impacts depending on the county, um, right? So you see, uh, Sarasota clearly getting the most of it, right? The biggest brunt of the damage 
no matter which metric you use, right? Carinia brevis cell counts or dead fish or uh, respiratory irritation levels. Then manatee is the clear cut second place and then uh, Pinellas third place. Um, not that it's a competition you would like to win, but uh, Pasco and Hillsborough clearly get in the least of the impacts. Um, then um, now with that in mind, let's actually look at the Twitter activity on the next slide. Um, and please focus on the right hand side picture, uh, which is per capita, uh, because on the left hand side where it's totals, uh, it would get overwhelmed with counties that had more population, more Twitter users. Hence, you would see like Hillsborough and Pinellas uh, getting a uh, higher representation, even though they didn't get as much of an impact compared to other counties. On the right hand side, the per capita adjustment gives you much more representative uh, hierarchy uh, in terms of Twitter activity. And you have two types of Twitter activity. As we mentioned, one is just explicitly geotagged tweets to come from the area. and all geomatches means including also those who were just matched to the area by their profile information. Um, and if you focus on the blue ones, right, so the blue bars on the right hand side, they are the most representative of the hierarchy of red tide impacts we saw on the previous slide, because you see how Sarasota is clear the first place, Manatee clearly the second place, Pinal is clear the third, right, but still there is a good chunks of space between them and then Hillsborough and Pasco are at the last place and that's the clearest hierarchy reproduced by the Twitter um, uh, activity and uh, it's going to be a recurring theme that explicit geotags are the most reliable which is not a shocker because it's most representative of the person actually tweeting from the area um, yeah so all right so on the next slide you will uh, be able to see the temporal dynamics of the red tide. Um, so yeah, th at the top, you pretty much see how you have those clear cut five waves um, of the red tide. Uh, and uh, at the bottom, you see how the Twitter activity was correspond corresponding to it, right? So that is cumulative across the entire Tampa Bay region. So over here, I haven't broken up, uh, haven't broken it up by counties just yet. Uh, but you kind of see a pretty solid correspondence, right? So like the first wave was a quiet, relatively quiet one in June, but then in that late July, early August, when it's got the most traction, when the most impact was seen, and that's where the most Twitter activity happened, then the third wave was also considerable, was matched by a solid activity. Fourth wave, not as big, but you see a peak of explicit geotags, which are in blue once again definitely uh, matching it. And the fifth one was a quieter one towards the end and also had a bit of a peak there. Now let's break it up by counties. That's on the next slide, um, which is a bit more in of interest, right? So where we actually see uh, more localized impacts and how more localized Twitter activity corresponds to them. And you see uh, Sarasota, Manatee, Pinellas, like some of the most affected counties, good correspondence. Sure, the correlation is not as strong potentially as the for the overall uh, Tampa Bay surrounding area, but still keeps up at a solid like 0 0.79, 0 0.8 correlation. Uh, and for explicit geotags, correlation is much better. And you can start seeing a clearer in the Hillsborough case scenario where um, the uh, explicit geotags don't overreact to uh, things that might be happening in the neighboring counties because all geo matches, they include people who simply have their geo profile information pointing to like Tampa, for example, who still tweet about red tide, even though Tampa hasn't been hit by red tide as much as those uh, more southern areas. And explicit geotags reflect that because people do, didn't tweet and explicitly geotag themselves in Tampa, right? Uh, and uh, that's why you don't see that overreaction in geotag. Um, uh, metric. Uh, so it's again, reoccurring theme in that regard. And so if you see on the next slide, we made a further strides and kind of looking at more hyper localized area uh, breakdowns besides just county level, we'll also look at city level, zip code level. Uh, and then we also looked at more fine grain temporal frequency scales. So because before that, I showed you pictures that were on the weekly uh, scale where I took total red tide impacts on a weekly scale, total Twitter activity by week. Um, and then down here, you also see breakdown three days at a time or also on daily basis. 
and the correlations between Twitter activity and the red tide impacts definitely gets weaker, which is kind of expected, uh, but uh, still manageable, right? So like still manageable, especially for a total and county level, uh, for day, even for daily it keeps relatively strong correlations. And then for the weekly, uh, it, if you go down to city level, it's still somewhat respectable of, of about 0.50. Uh, correlations. So uh, yeah, let me move on to the next slide here. Uh, yeah, we've tried a bunch of other things. I feel like we're definitely getting short on time here, so I don't want to list all of that. But if any of your interests can definitely contact me on those. Um, and the thing is, none of those beat the very basic approach of looking at explicitly geotech tweets about red tide as an indicator of red tide impacts. It's still correlated the strongest out of everything else we've tried as far as Twitter metrics. Uh, and on the um, next slide, um, so another thing that we did is analyze kind of the topics that were being discussed around Red Tide um, on Twitter and um, match them up with research previously done uh, on uh, how it was covered in the media back in the day. So it was clear that environmental issues were brought up the, were brought up the most, then health concerns, were clear cut second and economy issues due to businesses closing down and things of that nature that was brought up third uh, among people. And that matches up with that research done uh, due, uh, according to the Red Tide event back in 2005 and six, where the hierarchy of concerns mentioned was the same. All right, so in the, on the next slide, uh, it's just a wrap up. Yeah, so it's everything that we already discussed. Um, really that explicitly geotag tweets were the way to go in terms of matching with the actual red tide impacts. And uh, as far as the actual concerns being uh, actively discussed by people, uh, environmental issues were the most discussed and then economy and health were second and third. Okay, so, and lastly, as a future work, okay, it's the next slide. Yeah, so for the future work, we are right now thinking on the next slide, please. Yeah, so we're thinking about a new college in collaboration with Tampa Bay Estuary Program is thinking of designing a public face and Twitter web dashboard uh, that, among other features, would track recent Twitter activity on the topic of red tide, get a pulse of public's experiences, requests, questions, concerns, right? Kind of like this very last thing that I was talking about, whether it's environmental health concerns and so on and so forth, right? Focus a bit more on that side rather than pure correlation. Um, and then such dashboard could serve to further inform response of the local planning agencies when next event of that magnitude comes around, improve communication between public and local government, and last but not least, inc increase public awareness about uh, such cr critical environmental issues. So thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so sorry about such a hectic uh, setup with everything, but uh, I was asking for it by not showing up in person. So yeah, apologies for all of that. Yeah. Uh, right, are we, are we good? Yeah, because I cannot hear anything, so. Sorry about that. Thank you, Andre. I think we have time for about two questions. Does anyone have questions for Andre? If so, I'm just, just a reminder, please raise your hand and Joe will bring you a microphone. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, quick question. Uh, do you have any information on, on who was tweeting? Uh, you know, demographics, uh, institutional, were there tourists, locals? Yeah. Correct. Uh, well, yeah. So as far as like tourist locals, I feel like it's a bit tough to infer in many cases besides using the pro again, that profile information or where they come from. Right. So, because that's what kind of shows where they're technically originally from. Of course, if we were to trust that information that they post in their user profiles. So that's definitely a possibility to look into that. Uh, and that's one other thing that we we're considering. It was that slide that I quickly skimmed over, but uh, it was saying we were trying to break down accounts by like type of an account, whether it was like a citizen or a media government account. And that could also be done, as you say, potentially whether it was a tourist or a local resident, uh, 
yeah and uh, but the thing is yeah it didn't kind of lead us to any improvements as far as correlations are concerned but again it's something that can definitely be focused on as the actual kind of like studying the overall discussion around red tide and who is talking about what specifically so um yeah all righty well thank you so much mm -hmm. andre and last but and last but not least, our final presentation will be from Jill Carr. Jill is a coastal data scientist with the Mass Bays National Estuary Partnership and will be presenting It Can Be Done, Increasing the Quality, Usability, and Distribution of Community Science Data. Take it away, Jill. Great, thank you. Um, I'm looking at the uh, presenter view. Is that what everyone else is seeing? There we go. Great, thank you. And you can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so let's just jump right in. Uh, next slide, please. So like all other NEPs, uh, we rely on high quality environmental data to report on conditions in our estuaries. And along our 1,100 miles of coastline, we have over 40 volunteer-based groups conducting monitoring. The 20 or so coastal watershed groups are shown on the map on the left. And then there are another 20 or so pond and lake association groups. These volunteer monitoring programs provide the highest spatial and temporal resolution data available. So it's a priority of ours at Mass Bays to support their ability to collect and share quality data. However, the groups have varying degrees of technical capacity for things like QAP development and approval, that's quality assurance project planning, data QAQC, data analysis, and data sharing. My talk today will highlight two new tools that help increase the quality and quantity of shared data. First, one that supports the development and approval of QAPs, and the other, a standardized process for data QC analysis and sharing. Next, next, next. Thank you. Uh, so we're thrilled that after almost two years of development, the AquaQAP tool was officially launched in September. AquaQAP is an open source web-based application to help community groups generate QAPs for water quality monitoring and benthic assessments in both coastal and fresh waters. Users advance through the tool to enter information about their project background, sampling design, and data management plans. Entries are compiled into a generated QAP document that automatically formats and fills in troves of information to support the provided details. Now to show you a few examples of the user experience. Next. Within the tool, the menu on the left shows the screens that must be completed before a QAP can be generated. Next. Uh, next. Users work through their screens and track their progress toward completion. One particular, particularly important screen is shown here. Uh, it's the water quality concerns screen. When a user selects their concern, be it nutrients, bacteria, benthic health, or a combination of these, the tool begins to do work in the background. The response on this screen will inform future screens with fields relevant to those concerns. For example, the appropriate parameters to measure eutrophication, if that was the concern that was selected. In the final QAP, sections of narrative text and tables will be automatically populated with methods, data quality objectives, and details specific to those concerns and parameters chosen. I'll show some examples of that in a moment. Next. Next. But first, here is an example of a more narrative type screen, the record handling procedures screen. So throughout the tool, anytime there is a narrative field, it includes the option to view example text in case users aren't sure of the appropriate level of detail or format needed. And then after completing all screens, the user clicks the button in the top right to generate a Word document of their QAP. Next. The document is around 100 pages long, so I'll just share an example of the table of contents here. All QAP sections that are required by EPA and MassDEP are represented, such as project management elements, data generation and acquisition, assessment and oversight, data review, and then placeholders for the appropriate attachments at the end. Next. And then here are some examples of some of the tables that are automatically generated within the QAP. For data quality indicators on the left, 
users need not dig up or come up with these values and then wonder if they're acceptable to EPA and MassDEP because we've done it for them and the agencies have already weighed in. The same goes for the field quality control and anal analytical methods shown on the right. Importantly, I should note that users do have to understand what it is they're agreeing to when they include um, these automatically generated figures into their QAP, and they need to actually implement them into their program. Next. And in the six months that the tool has been live, we've received great feedback on it, and it's getting lots of use by local groups and even interest beyond our region. And while open to all, um, anyone is welcome to create an account and start building QAPs. I should note that it is somewhat tailored to Massachusetts in terms of the approved data quality objectives and, and other elements. So uh, folks that want to use it from outside of Massachusetts should just check um, and ensure that it meets the local reviewing agency's needs. So now with the few minutes I have left, um, I will describe, if you can just go back one. <clears throat> I'll describe new R tools that we're developing to standardize water quality data, QAQC and analysis for watershed groups. And this is with funding from an exchange network grant. And for this project, we partnered with a local use case expert who's a scientist at a local watershed organization with expertise in R and data visualizations, and also partnered with your local R expert, Marcus Beck from TBEP, who is developing the code for the project. We've taken on this work after hearing feedback from watershed groups that their data workflows are very time consuming, can be error prone, and they're really not sure how to deal with quality control. Next. So shown here is the proposed workflow for the new tool. In a nutshell, the user will upload a file that meets some basic formatting requirements that's in the center of the diagram. And they can go on to use four different packages in a sequence or independently to screen, analyze, and format their data. And I'll describe our vision for each of these four packages. Next. In the first QAQC process, the tool will summarize quality control sample data, such as blank and duplicate samples, flagging any samples that did not meet data quality objectives, such as field blanks that detected an analyte above the minimum detection limit in the top left, where you see miss, or where a sample and a duplicate exceeded relative percent difference objectives, like in the lower right. These are sort of less exciting outputs from the tool, but um, they're definitely necessary. And they address feedback that we've heard from regulatory end users like MassDEP, that they really need to see better documentation of QC results before accepting external data. Next. The second QAQC screening will check for reasonableness. The format might include box plots showing all data from a given year, like on the left, and then you can see the outliers there, or it could include scatter plots of current year data against historic data, like on the right. Uh, this is definitely still in development. We're still collecting input on this, um, and we'll, we will likely develop other ways of evaluating outliers too, um, for example, on a site-by-site -site basis, or by being able to, to create clusters of sites or months. Next. WQX, or the Water Quality Exchange, is the mechanism for uploading data to the National Water Quality Portal that's on the bottom left. And that portal is a searchable, filterable repository that most federal and many state entities contribute their data to. Citizen science data are becoming increasingly present in the portal too. This portion of the R package will generate a custom WQX template, putting the user's data into appropriate columns and creating placeholder columns for fields that will need to be filled in. This piece is part of a greater effort we've been making to get more community science data uploaded to the portal so that we can access it at MassBase for our reporting. And then portal data also get incorporated into other tools like EPA's How's My Waterway on the bottom right. Over the last two years, I've provided a lot of training and support to build capacity to submit data to WQX. So that's how this part of the R tools fits in with other ongoing work at MassBase. Next. <clears throat> and then for data analysis, we envision the tool offering a variety of plotting and mapping options, like time series plots showing regulatory thresholds, and then of course maps. You might recognize the map on the right from the Peconic Estuary Partnerships tools, which were also developed by Marcus. We may even develop functions that generate HTML or PDF reports that include graphics as well as narrative sections. And ultimately, our goal is to, pr to produce straightforward functions that don't require a whole lot of R knowledge in order to use the tools. And then as folks get more comfortable with R, 
they can further customize and expand upon what we've created. Next. Now, in terms of status, this project is in progress. Last month, we conducted a needs assessment survey of all watershed organizations in Massachusetts to get feedback on which parameters and themes the tool should target. Last week, we hosted a follow-up meeting to demonstrate the workflow and example outputs and gain feedback on style and function preferences. We're now entering the design phase and we'll have a draft version ready for beta testing by September and a final version by November. And at that time, we'll launch a series of trainings on the tools as well as a community of practice where folks can turn for support. And my question to anyone in, um, in the audience is if you're aware of any really great beginner R resources for water quality scientists, please do feel free to share those. Um, we're putting together a list of, of resources that can go out to watershed groups. Next. And just in closing, um, we feel that user-friendly tools can improve the quality and quantity of data accessible to us for reporting, especially when users provide input throughout the development process. Feel free to take advantage of AquaQuap, keep an eye out for the R tools, and connect with me on all things WQX if that's something you're working on. And thanks so much. Thank you, Jill. We do have a few minutes for questions. So hi there. Can you hear me? Jill, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, rad. Um I'm super excited about this because I just wrote a co-op and we went back and forth with the EPA for a while. Um so I guess I have two questions. Um, does this work with continuous monitoring as well, or is it just discrete sampling? Yeah, that's a great question. For now, it is just discrete sampling, but um, we kind of have a, an ongoing wish list of things we would like to add to AquaQuap, and that would include continuous. Also, is there any sort of like joint partnership with Esri or anything like that, or any sort of open platform uh, like mapping software, or is it just kind of with the EPA's uh, water na uh, national water model? Yeah, that's a good question. No, no, currently, as far as I know, um, are you referring to data in WQX? Yeah. As, as far as I know, it, it's, um, it only goes through their How's My Waterway visualization tool, but I feel like with WQX and the water quality portal becoming so prominent, um, more and more tools are going to be extracting data directly from it. I mean, at, at Mass Bays, we're, we're currently developing just a local viewer of data that will do exactly the same. So I wouldn't be surprised if in the future there are other Esri and, and other mapping type tools that extract data directly from it. That's awesome. This is a really cool project. I'm really excited. Thank you, Thank you so much. Are there any other questions for Jill? Thank you. That was a great presentation. My name is Maya Trotz at the University of South Florida. I just had a question in terms of scaling your AquaQuap cap. Um, what are the plans? What is the financing needed to do something like that if it's sort of something that could be not just national but global? Mm, interesting. Um, there, there would be some um, some challenges with, with creating something that could be used uh, on a global scale or even on a national scale in the sense that not every um, QAP uh, approval agency wants to see the same things in a QAP or has the same requirements. Um, so ours, ours is tailored to Massachusetts in that way, but there are lots of other tools out there and uh, documentation that could guide anyone in building a QAP anywhere. Uh, but as far as an actual form-based tool, ours is the only one that I'm aware of. Uh, and I suppose it could, it could be scaled up. It would be rather expensive. Um, ours, just at the state scale, was um, around $200,000 to develop. Um, so, you know, it's sort of uh, the price could only go up from there if you were trying to expand the scope even more. Oh, yes. And I, I see Pam um, Debona is putting in the chat that the code used to build AquaQuap is open source. It's shared by, via the Exchange Network. So anyone anywhere is really welcome to um, to take that code and and customize it for their own, you know, their own locale. 
Thank you. Were there any other virtual questions? Nope. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jill, and thank you to all of our presenters here this morning.